everyone, welcome back to The Move, where we're vibing through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Koo, and in today's episode, we're talking about that time in the Bible where God basically decides that snakes aren't allowed to fly anymore, and childbirth would be really, really painful. If you're wondering what in the world am I talking about, we're talking about Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 24. My guest today is the one, the only pastor, Kessia Rain. Um, I'm starting off with a theory here that I, I know maybe not is like the most solidified biblical principle of all. And then I want to transition to the most important part of this passage because like there's a lot here pregnant with oh, pregnant. There you go. There's there's a pun there. I'm pregnant with meaning uh, that I want to actually get to. But I remember thinking about this and hearing a theory that back in the day, originally before the curse, serpents could fly. Have you heard of this idea before? I have heard of this idea and I think it's because in Genesis 3:14 the Lord says now you have to crawl on your belly. Right, which is kind of implying that before the serpents weren't doing that. And there's even an allusion, I think it's in Isaiah chapter 14 where it actually talks about like this flying serpent. And so I'm just wondering like man, if things didn't go wrong, would we have had like real life dragons? <gasps> That is, I never thought of that before. I would love that. But if they could be small, like <laughs> like size, like a pet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, like Mushu seen. from uh, the Disney Mulan. Yes, exactly. Oh, that would be the coolest pet ever. I never thought of that. Yes, a dragon is like a snake with wings. Oh, right. Goodness. And, and it, it makes a little bit of sense in that a lot of cultures have some kind of mythology about dragons and flying serpents. And it's like, oh, maybe that's just the way it was. And when the story gets passed down through different cultures and it's disseminated, it manifests itself in its own mythology or not. I That is fascinating. I never thought of that. But yes, <laughs> We're not going to stake uh, our lives on this claim that serpents had wings, but I don't know. It's, a, it's kind of a fun idea to think about. And maybe it's real, maybe it's not. But let's go ahead and transition to the more important elements of this passage. There's, there's so many places to start. There's the curse uh, that you know is clear for the serpent, for the women, for the man. We could talk about that. We could talk about like the skins. Like Where would you like to start for this episode today? So glad you asked because I want to ask you, who do you think was cursed? What was cursed in Genesis 3? Because oftentimes this passage we're looking at, Genesis 3, 14 to 24, mm -hmm. could be called the curse or curses right. or the punishment. So, so just off the top of your head, what you've heard maybe, what got cursed uh, after the fall into sin? Well, I think the one who clearly gets the, the kind of the worst deal is definitely women. Like in the last year, I had to watch my hero of a wife, Emily, deliver our child. And oh my goodness, it was, it felt like something out of an alien versus predator movie. It was like look, the whole thing. I won't be too visual in case some of our listeners are squeamish. Um, but let's say it was a very real and a crazy experience. And then I think about how the man's side of the curse is like, you got to go work out in the field. And then I think about what I do for a living where I sit in an air conditioned room behind microphones and a camera. And I create content like this for a living. And I'm just like, yeah, I would really rather have my side of the curse. Cause it doesn't seem like it affects my life very much. I can understand how maybe hundreds of years ago when I would have had to work in a farm like that might've sucked. Um, but Given the choice between the two, I'm definitely choosing the man's side of the equation. So we could definitely say, uh, modernly, women got the worst end of the deal. <laughs> yeah, you might be onto something there. One thing that I learned while rereading this passage was that um, the, actually it specifically says two things got cursed. Okay. And the woman isn't one of them. Oh. Okay. So actually, so okay. in, in verse 14, God says to the serpent, Cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Okay. So the serpent gets cursed mm -hmm. and now has to crawl in its belly and eat dust all the days of its life. And then he gives this kind of promise. Maybe we'll get into that later in verse 15. Mm -hmm. And then there's no, the word curse is not shown up at all when God is speaking to the woman in verses 16 and 17. Interesting. Verse I'm, I'm skipping ahead and I'm seeing that the next thing that's cursed is the ground. That's right. So the man and the woman huh. are not cursed, but the serpent is cursed and the ground is cursed. And in, in fact, it says cursed is the ground because of you. God talking to the man there. Oh. So it's interesting. So the serpent is cursed because of what huh. he has done, but the ground is cursed because of what Adam 
before Adam and Eve have done. Well, th- this is this is very different than the kind of narrative that most of us have in our head, right? Like I was telling you beforehand, like we're very likely going to call this episode very tongue in cheek, by the way. So don't get mad at me. The the episode for this title is probably going to be something like "Thanks a lot, Eve." I, I think about all those memes, like "Thanks Obama" kind of a thing. Like that 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 was what was in my mind. It's like. Eve screwed up, she ate the fruit, and now we're all in this like horrible like situation. But what you're showing me is that actually there's never really a uh, blame placed on Eve specifically if we're going to go to the point like kind of like the stricter reading of the text. It seems like Adam and the serpent are the ones who are culpable, and that's what results in the curses. I think that she I think she's probably culpable too, but but we often interpret verse 16 there's a whole long history of basically using this for harsh exploitative subjugation of women Hmm. and i think it's important to note that that actually doesn't come from um god's sovereign curse of eve Hmm. like oh well this is what god this this was a a result of her sin god cursed her to be subjugated to to man Hmm. Uh, no actually that's not in the text and in fact i think there's there's something to be said for even the curse of the ground. Hmm. God says to Adam that the ground is cursed because of what Adam did. And Hmm. so one of the things we have to ask is, are these things that are being described here about childbearing and desire and what's happening with the ground and toil and thistles and all that kind of stuff. Is that happening because God is so mad that he's like, and you you know what? And also pain and a pox on both your houses, you know, <laughs> you know dishonor on like, you and your family and your cow and the ground. Like, I bite my thumb at you in the old Shakespearean way, but just like, ah, I, I vex you and hex you and punishment and curses on you. Hmm. Um, in other words, is it, is it prescriptive? Like God's like, well, this is what I'm causing to happen now because I'm mad at you. Or is it, this is what I'm causing to happen to somehow be a blessing to you now that sin is in the world. Hmm. And or is it this is what's going to happen to the world. This is what the world is going to be like now because sin is now in it. Ooh, interesting. Do do you have a particular leaning in out of those three options? Because I've always heard it in the kind of the first first or second context that you described. It's either that God is actively cursing people as a result of their terrible actions. And I know that this kind of narrative seems to be the easiest to assume uh, of all the three narratives, if you kind of have a skeptical view of God, if you were raised in a family like mine, where like maybe uh, this is stereotypes being played out, but like Asian uh, uh, immigrant parents are kind of hard on their kids kind of a thing. Like it, it just seems like it matches up with some of the uh, like when you do something bad, something bad happens to you kind of experience or paradigm of life. Or the second one where it's like, no, no, you're going to be cursed, but it's going to be good for you, which is kind of a weird way of saying that. Like that, how does, how exactly does that work? Do you you have a direction that you lean? Well, I think what, so definitely going like a little bit outside of Genesis three, but looking at the whole scripture here, Mm -hmm. it seems like what Genesis three is, is opening up here is how the whole scripture testifies to that suffering was not part of God's original plan. Right. And so so sin is not part of God's plan for the world. Death is not part of plan- God's plan for the world. Suffering is not part of God's plan for the world. And we see way at the end of the book in Revelation 21, how God says, hey, the world will be remade and none of these things will be there. Hmm. Pain and sin and death and suffering and tears, none of that's going to be there. So it makes sense to me that that pain, what he says to the woman, for instance, that pain and childbearing and, and this uh, conflicted relationship that this is a result of sin. He's Hmm. describing what the world is like now, but when he describes, when he talks to the man and says, the ground is cursed because of you, Hmm. I think that's also describing a result. Like you, you brought sin to the world. The the whole earth is now in suffering. And so you could go to Romans eight, where it says all creation is now in the pain of childbirth. Ooh as it relates to verse 16, but like you, you made this happen, but I think there is a blessing in it. So, so work is now a blessing. Imagine if people in, in, in sin and fallen experience and everything just could have the kind of Edenic life that they had before where food was just, I mean, like everything they needed was all right there. But instead now of using that creative energy to build positive culture, Hmm. They have all this time 
uh, without the refining influence of the blessing of work. So I think it's, I tend to read it as based on these clues in the text that these things are happening because sin is now in the world, but because God is good like this, he can, he can craft that to still somehow be a blessing and make it redemptive and point us toward the final good reality that, that will happen in Jesus. That, that's really good. It, it makes me think of that, uh, I don't know, is it an idiom where like idle hands are like the devil's, what is it? Idle hands are the devil's yeah. work. Exactly. It's this idea that when you have too much free time, it's not good. It reminds me of the story of David and Bathsheba, where it talks about how this was a time when the, when the kings would go to war. In other words, David should not be home right now. He should be out leading his armies, and yet he's at home doing nothing and that's when things really go south is that when he has so much free time like this is where things can go wrong and so i, I definitely get what you're saying in that that work was meant to be a blessing and perhaps but for our community uh, our community is one that really values the sabbath commandment right it's like oh, okay you get a rest you get a rest you get a rest yes but the other half of the commandment also is that there's six days to work like yeah. there's a blessing in the rest. Yes, there's also a blessing in the work in that it, 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 it's, it's a focal point for your energy, for, for your attention, for all these things, and that this is a redemptive and good thing for us to do. Yeah, totally. I totally see that. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I was noticing in this passage, and I think that this is fair to say that the very first promise uh, ever in the Bible is actually in this text. And it's a very weird thing because when you think about like the promises uh, that, that the scripture give towards us, like God promises, you know, a hope and a future, you know, uh, we, we see all these very positive sounding things. But when I read this promise, it doesn't sound immediately uh, beneficial. The, the, the promise is the yeah. word enmity, which if I understand correctly, enmity, uh, verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpents. Mm-hmm. That the first promise that God ever gives is the promise of hatred. Mm-hmm. I know it's not the kind of thing you like typically find on like a mug at a Christian <laughs> bookstore, like hostility. Yeah. Hatred, yes, you know? exactly. Wear that on a shirt or get that tattooed on your arm. Get it on calligraphy for above your dining table or whatever. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think it, what is great about this is um, the whole world has been in harmony, right? Mm-hmm. Even Adam have just disobeyed God agreed with Satan, um, agreed and, and put themselves under sin. The whole world's under sin. So everything that was now harmonious is now broken and disjointed. Mm -hmm. And so you'd expect like the first promise is going to be like, and harmony will reign again. And instead he's like animosity, hatred, uh, Mm. difficulty, uh, conflict is the first promise. But if the conflict is between the right two parties, it actually ends up being good news. So if, 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 between Satan and the seed of the woman hmm. is hatred and enmity and conflict. That's kind of, that's where we want that to be. It's not like God's promises that, that women and men will be in conflict right. or that people on the earth will be in conflict or whatever. Like that's not God's good plan, but God's good plan is that they have this serpent, right? Mm-hmm. And this deception and this um, anti-God and this cast doubt on God's goodness and promises and undermine God. Right. Hmm. And then we have, the woman and her seed. So this whole human lineage, but even especially in Christ, like that conflict, we, we want that to be there. In other words, God is not totally giving us over to agreement with Satan. He, Mm. He maintains that conflict in the human heart so that we're not just a hundred percent given over to, to Satan's whims and wiles. Yeah. I, I love this because it shows that God is not passive in the story of redemption. It's not as though that Adam and Eve screwed up and now God's like, ah, dang it. You guys got to leave the garden and hope you guys find your way back. No, no. God's like literally saying like, Hey, you guys, there's this thing that happens and there's going to be all of these effects on the world and around you. And it's going to impact your relationships and all these things. And yet I'm literally going to go to war for you and on your behalf. I think right there at the very beginning, it's beautiful because it, it encapsulates some of this gospel truth that I, like God is the one who fights for us and on our behalf. We're, we're incapable of fighting ourselves. And even when we try, we desperately fail, but God's going to show up and he's going to fight. And, and then there's this thing where God gives them, I think, it's, is it in this passage or am I jumping ahead? But he gives them clothing 
Yeah, it's in this one, verse 21. Verse 21. Yeah, yeah. He gives them skins, which is so interesting because, like, this is the perfect world. There's no death yet. Where do these skins come from? And obviously, we're going to jump forward to, I think, is it Revelation, where it talks about Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Like, here's another fantastic insight. God's going to war, and it's going to cost something. There's going to be death as a result, kind of redeem things. And there's there's this, just this tiny hint that Jesus is going to come and sacrifice himself and clothe us with his own with his own goodness yeah it's it's important for us to know that god was not uh like jesus didn't come way after adam and eve because god couldn't figure out how to solve sin Hmm. you know he had the plan from the beginning so he tells the woman the serpent and the man right here that hey there will be a seed and that that one that offspring that child of eve Now, it ends up being way down the line. It's not the first one, even though there are clues in Genesis 4 that the first time she has a son, she thinks it's the Messiah. Oh, man. But but God has has a child coming who will strike the head of the serpent. Like, he will crush Satan under his feet, which is a promise that God shares with us in Romans 16, 19. I love it. you will crush Satan under your feet. Why? Because we participate in the victory of Christ. Amen. Amen. I love that so much. It, there's so much to unpack here. We don't have enough time to do it, but I want you to think, and I'm speaking directly to the listener now, every time, like put yourself in the position of Adam and Eve, like you're looking forward to this promise, this promise of, of the seed, this thing that's going to redeem you, that's going to reconcile you. You can get back into the garden every time that there's a kid. Like, this could be it. Like, talk about anticipation. Talk about hope. And I think about, like, me and Emily when we're we're in the waiting room or when we're going to the hospital and we're awaiting Mateo's arrival. Like, talk about just the hope and eager anticipation. It's a beautiful thing. And maybe that's just going to change the way that we read the genealogies in the chapters to come. (laughs) Because every single person that comes in is a new potential addition to the story. Anyways, that's all the time that we have for. I'm excited to be able to continue diving in. Kessia Rain, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you so very much. Hey, before you go, we wanted to give a shout out. And this is something that, as you can tell already by now, if you've been watching all the episodes, we're going to try to make like a regular part of the program because there's a lot of awesome things that are happening out there in the world. And we just kind of want to share different influences, different programs or shows or organizations that we think are awesome and deserve attention. And so today we're going to be talking about the Rabbit Room, which is something that I never heard of until today. Pastor Kessie Rain, would you mind telling us what exactly is the Rabbit Room? I love it. The Rabbit Room, I think of as a Christian artists collective. So they sort of nourish and publish and produce and highlight Christian stories and music and art. So I love it as a place. They have a podcast. They have like a a yearly gathering and a whole bunch of resources, bookstore and stuff like that. So I've benefited from products there, stuff that they've posted. So um, I like it as, as a artistic way to think about, look at, and be enriched in the Christian story. That's awesome. And to be clear, this isn't a sponsored post. We don't necessarily have a direct connection to the rabbit room. We're not on the team. We don't benefit financially. We just think, hey, this is pretty cool. And if you're in the into the arts, maybe you'd like it, which I'm going to ask you this question. Are, are you kind of an artsy fartsy kind of a person yourself? I I am. I am. So there, if, if we keep going, you'll probably hear there are another few artsy fartsy shout outs that I'll want to be giving. Yeah. So oh. I especially love the poetry and liturgy stuff that comes poetry. out of Poetry. I, mm-hmm. you know, poetry is something that has largely felt inaccessible to me my entire life. I, I, for me, and I hate that this is the reality, but when I hear poetry read, oftentimes my eyes glaze over. I kind of like, <laughs> like I, I end up in a coma because I'm just like, what in the world are they saying? I think one of the things that uh, maybe is a gift from God is I have the ability to disseminate information into as, as clear and concise a way as possible. I don't always do this greatly, but, but this is something that I, I pride myself in. And so when it's poetry, I'm just like, why don't you just say what you mean so i don't know maybe i gotta go check out the rabbit room so i can grow my appreciation for poetry yeah where are the bullet points (laughs) but come on people i'm learning more and more how it's the poets and it's the visionaries how it's the creatives that really contribute them i don't know i have contributed a lot to the kingdom of god and i'm gonna i'm gonna assume the rabbit uh, the rabbit room is exactly one of these places Absolutely. I'm going to just tell you that I've become convinced that to understand scripture, you have to be able to read poetry. Oh, no. Why'd you have to say that? 
It's your growing edge, Justin. <laughs> this is a this is a low hanging fruit. It's an opportunity for growth, and I'm gonna take it. <laughs>